Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to McLean Grand Rounds today. It's my privilege and pleasure um, to um, welcome Antonia Seligowski, um, who's an instructor at HMS and assistant neuroscience at McLean, who's going to speak today on PTSD and cardiovascular disease. And thanks, as always, um, Steve and Chris and Margie for making grand, virtual Grand Rounds happen. Antonia is an assistant neuroscience um, in the Neurobiology of Fear Lab and an instructor at HMS on her way to being assistant professor soon. She's also a licensed clinical psychologist, having completed her pre-doc internship and post-doc fellowship at McLean and was part of the internship, the psychology internship program at McLean and BHP. She um, uses methods such as fear conditioning, EEG in her research, and is focused on neurophysiological underpinnings of PTSD with her research aiming to understand how the neurophysiology of PTSD increases susceptibility to both cardiovascular disease in the neurocardiac circuit and how these mechanisms are influenced by sex hormones. She's had fund independent funding from NIH with the NUK Award, a new, um, American Heart Association a grant, and was awarded a BERT scholarship as well, for which she's working with, with um, Jill Goldstein in collaboration. And her studies on the impact of estradiol on neurophysiology, cardiovascular, and women with PTSD. On top of all that, Antonia is an amazing mentor, a wonderful colleague and friend, and has really been a great leader of our physiology programs and our broader trauma research. So welcome, Antonia. Thanks for speaking today. Really look forward to a great educational um, grand rounds about PTSD and cardiovascular system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that wonderful, very kind introduction. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all today about some new insights into the link between PTSD and cardiovascular disease. So before uh, getting too far into things, I wanna talk about PTSD. So post-traumatic stress disorder is a disorder of trauma non-recovery. So most individuals will experience a traumatic event at some point in their lives. And about 8% of the population go on to experience really debilitating symptoms of PTSD. Our prevailing model for how PTSD develops is fear learning, which is a form of classical conditioning. So you have an aversive unconditioned stimulus, the trauma, and at the time of the trauma, this leads to an unconditioned response, fear perceived threat. And this unconditioned response is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. So this is our fight or flight system, our normal stress response, which causes our heart rate to increase, blood pressure to go up, uh, pupils to dilate, nor, uh, norepinephrine to be released, et cetera. So it's evolutionarily protective, right? This prepares us to deal with the threat in some way. But what we think happens in PTSD is that some sort of pairing occurs. So at the time of the trauma, you have any number of stimuli in the environment that can become paired. So in this example, we have an explosion as the trauma and the other neutral stimulus as this green Jeep, but it can be anything. And in many cases is multiple things. It can be a smell, the time of day, a certain type of person, um, time of year, et cetera. And so at the time of the trauma, that stimulus is paired with the unconditioned stimulus. Um, but subsequently that formerly neutral stimulus can trigger that stress response on its own. And so now the stimulus and the response are both called conditioned because of that pairing. Now, importantly, unlike Pavlov's dog, this only takes one trial because a trauma is so salient, so intense, we don't need repeated trials. So what you end up having is this stress response going off um, in the absence of threat. So, you know, somebody is uh, getting in a car, supposed to be going to drive to pick somebody up, and that sympathetic system is, that alarm is going off but that's coupled with an inability to inhibit that fear response, which is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. This is our rest and digest system responsible for slowing heart rate and reducing blood pressure, stimulating digestion. Now, these are the common phenotypes that we see in PTSD, but in terms of the diagnosis, um, there are 20 specific symptoms of PTSD across four symptom clusters. So you have five re-experiencing symptoms. These are things like intrusive memories, um, exaggerated uh, emotional distress to reminders, nightmares. Um, and then cluster C is avoidance. So you have internal avoidance of thoughts and memories, as well as avoidance of external stimuli, people, places, and things. And we have seven symptoms in the cluster D, negative changes in cognition and mood. This includes negative beliefs about the self, others, and the world, like 
it was my fault, um, people can't be trusted, as well as anhedonia, generally feeling numb, loss of interest. And then cluster E has six symptoms. So this is hyperarousal, things like exaggerated startle, hypervigilance, constantly looking for threat. Now, in addition to these primary symptoms, the first criterion is criterion A. It's the trauma itself. And we use the word trauma to describe a lot of different things in our lives. In the case of PTSD, we're talking about a specific type of trauma. And that is something that involves actual or threatened death or serious injury or sexual violence to you or someone else. Now that trauma could have occurred at any point in someone's life. In someone's life. Um, the symptoms have to have persisted for at least a month or more and caused significant distress and or functional impairment. Uh, so this is where I have my first poll question, which is how many ways are there to have PTSD? Meaning how many different combinations of all of those different symptoms I just talked about. And I should say you need one symptom from cluster B, one from cluster C, two from D and two from E to have a diagnosis. Um, so the options are 200, 5,000, 80,000, 600,000, or over a million. So Marge, if you could please help with the poll there. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like the results were tied for 80,000 and over a million. Um, actually, yeah, the answer is around 600,000. Um, so somebody actually did the math here. In 2013, the DSM added a fourth symptom cluster. We used to have three. And when we had three symptom clusters, there were about 80,000 ways to have PTSD. Now there are about 636,000 ways to have PTSD. Um, so I bring this up because this is a theme throughout this talk. PTSD is highly heterogeneous. So those phenotypes even that I described, they may not perfectly fit for everybody. Um, there are likely a lot of different subtypes that we haven't fully characterized yet. So it's just really important to consider this throughout our research and clinical work in PTSD. Uh, despite this heterogeneity, there are some repeated findings, uh, one of which is that PTSD is associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular disease. Compared to the general population, uh, individuals with PTSD are more likely to have myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure, as well as cardiovascular disease risk factors like hypertension and endothelial dysfunction. And I'm gonna talk more about endothelial dysfunction, but briefly that's the health of blood vessels. Now the evidence for this link is so compelling that in 2018, the NIH convened a working group to bring together experts to establish the state of the literature, uh, but to identify gaps and priorities for future research. And these are some of the things I'm gonna be talking about today. So one is mechanisms. How is this actually happening? What are the pathways? Uh, some that have been implicated thus far are the autonomic nervous system, the renin-angiotensin system, and endothelial function. We'll talk about each of these. And a few other mechanisms that I won't be speaking to today, but that are implicated are inflammation, metabolism, and behavior, things like smoking and diet. Um, most likely it is a confluence of all of these things interacting as opposed to one you know, perfect underlying mechanism where you can draw a direct line. Another priority is to characterize sex differences in this link. So this is consistent with the NIH's SABV or sex as a biological variable policy, which encourages and in some cases requires researchers to consider sex in some way in their research. And then treatment. So there's really a need and I think an opportunity to add cardiovascular disease measures to ongoing PTSD trials. But there's also a real need to identify therapeutic targets and I'll talk more about that later. So starting with mechanisms, talked a bit about the autonomic nervous system already. So that sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the exaggerated fear that we see in PTSD. And in the laboratory that's been demonstrated um, by looking at resting heart rate and blood pressure. And we see that that's elevated in people with PTSD compared to controls, uh, but at rest, but also in response to challenge, like listening to a trauma script. You also see increased skin conductance, our sweat response, uh, and increased eye blink startle. And I have a star here because that's actually not an autonomic indicator. It's a brainstem mediated reflex, but skin conductance and eye blink startle are both used in conditioning paradigms. 
where you're trying to model that fear learning by pairing an aversive unconditioned stimulus like a, a shock or an air blast with uh, various condition stimuli like shapes or, or tones. Um, and so in PTSD, you see increased skin conductance and startle responding during these conditioning studies compared to healthy and trauma exposed controls. And this is coupled with that poor fear inhibition con control by the parasympathetic nervous system. So in the laboratory, this is typically indexed by heart rate variability. So we see lower levels of HRV in PTSD, again, both at rest and in response to challenge. And this is essentially the time interval between heartbeats, which is reflective of how well the vagus nerve is stimulating the heart's sinoatrial node, which it directly projects to and releases acetylcholine to slow heart rate. Um, you can try this yourself by um, taking a normal slow inhale in and a nice long prolonged exhale. Uh, do that for a few minutes and you'll be stimulating your vagus nerve and slowing heart rate. So it's thought that the, the disruption in both of these systems really interacts and strains the overall stress response system. Again, that alarm is going off constantly and, and people are not able to shut it off. And that really strains the cardiovascular systems. So you have you know, chronically elevated heart rate, blood pressure, et cetera. So it's thought that this is one of the primary mechanisms by which individuals with PTSD develop cardiovascular disease. Now, a more newly implicated mechanism is the renin angiotensin system. Uh, briefly, this system is primarily responsible for regulating blood pressure. So you have the catalyst of, of this system being renin, uh, which is an enzyme released by the kidneys and ultimately leads to uh, the production of angiotensin II, the primary active peptide of this system. This is a vasoconstrictive peptide. And it does a number of things. Those that are most relevant here are that it increases norepinephrine release and sympathetic nervous system activity. It causes aldosterone secretion through the adrenal cortex, which increases blood pressure. And it leads to vasoconstriction, which also increases blood pressure. So one of the triggers of renin release is, is really low blood pressure, or maybe somebody's severely dehydrated or hemorrhage, a lot of blood loss. Um, so that's very good to have activation of this system in those instances. But one of the other triggers of renin release is stress and sympathetic nervous system activity. So it's thought that there may be a positive feedback loop in PTSD where stress is triggering activation of this system, which is causing further sympathetic activation and blood increased blood pressure in particular is, is why it's really of interest for the risk of cardiovascular disease and PTSD. Now, there've been a number of studies in mice showing that this system is implicated in fear extinction. Um, and so one of the studies, there's a lot, but one of the studies was led by Carrie here as well as Paul Marvar. And um, they used a fear extinction paradigm in mice where you know, this is a really great translational paradigm, right? Because you have uh, different condition stimuli. So in this case, you know, lights or tones, those being paired with an electric shock. And you're measuring the, the rodent sort of threat response. We won't really call it fear because we can't really say, say that it's fear, but um, you're trying to model that fear learning and you measure the movement of the cage. So the mice will freeze when they're you know, quote, afraid or sense of threat. And they treated half of the mice with Losartan, which is an AT1 receptor blocker. It blocks the binding of angiotensin II. And what they found was that the mice treated with Losartan demonstrated significantly lower freezing, suggesting that they had better fear extinction than the mice who were treated with a control. Now in humans, we've seen that inhibition of this system is associated with lower PTSD risk. So this was a study led by Nyla Corey and Kerry, um, the Grady Trauma Project. And they looked at medical records, so just cross-sectionally to see if there was a, an association between PTSD diagnosis and being on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, an angiotensin receptor blocker. So these are two medications that work on the, the renin angiotensin system. And what they found was that there were significantly lower rates of PTSD in the individuals who were on these medications compared to those who were not. And that it was specific to this system. So other commonly prescribed blood pressure medications are beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. And they did not find this association for those medications. And we recently replicated and extended this. Um, we had two samples, the original Grady Trauma Project sample, as well as our partner's healthcare biobank sample. 
And so we looked at renin angiotensin system inhibition and PTSD diagnosis, as well as possible sex effects. So that original sample, the Grady Trauma Project, is a highly traumatized inner city population in Atlanta, Georgia. You can see the PTSD prevalence is 33%, so quite high. Um, in this sample, we looked at sex effects and kind of confirmed what we see in the literature a lot, which is that there's worse PTSD overall in women. Um, but when we looked separately by sex, we saw that uh, renin angiotensin system inhibition was associated with lower PTSD only in men and not women. Further, we looked within the group on these medications and found that there was still worse PTSD in women. Uh, so the y-axis here is the PTSD symptom scale and a score of 14 or above is clinically significant PTSD. And so this is showing that even on these medications, women are still demonstrating clinically significant PTSD symptoms, whereas the men are not. And moving on to the biobank sample. Um, so this is a sample of over 116,000 individuals in our, our Partners Healthcare Biobank, significantly lower PTSD prevalence, only 5%. Um, but we did replicate the original findings. So you can see here, there's a significantly higher incidence of RAS inhibition or being on these medications in the no PTSD group. We also replicated that it was specific to this system and we did not have this finding for beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. We also wanted to break these groups down. So we looked at ACE inhibitors and ARBs separately and when we did that, we found that only the ARBs were significant. And remember, losartan is an ARB. So um, there really seems to be some specificity that maybe this is what's driving the overall effect. And then looking at sex effects, um, similar to what we saw in Grady and what we see generally, higher PTSD prevalence in women. Uh, when we compared the different drug groups uh, by sex, we saw that ARBs were actually significant in both sexes but that ACE inhibitors were only significant in women. So some takeaways, you know, we are having replication here that, that this renin angiotensin, that angiotensin system is likely implicated somehow in PTSD. I think we still don't fully understand how, um, but we know that there are possible sex effects that really should be considered in future research looking at this system. And we found specificity for ARBs. So, I also wanna talk about this clinical trial because again, Losartan is an ARB and we recently finished a clinical trial in PTSD. This was led by Carrie as well as Murray Steen at UCSD. It was a 10 week randomized control trial looking at Losartan versus placebo. Briefly, I can tell you we had similar improvement in both groups. So, you know, the uh, Y axis here, the CAPS-5, that's the clinician administered PTSD scale. So our gold standard measure of PTSD symptoms. And you can see that Really, it's a, it is a strong placebo response, actually, but Losartan still did not perform better than placebo. Uh, even when you look at just people who completed treatment and got the maximum dosage of Losartan, you have a difference at week four, but that goes away by the primary endpoint of week 10. So possible explanations here. One that we have to consider is that it, it just doesn't work, right? That it's just the system is not relevant. We're looking at different things. I don't think that's the case. I think there's so much preclinical work that suggests that there is something here, but we have to better characterize it in humans. Um, here, the outcome is CAPS, it's PTSD. We didn't look at fear extinction. So that's one thing. Um, and also we had moderate PTSD in the sample. So to give you an idea, a score on the CAPS, looking at the first graph, a score on the CAPS of 25 or above was required, but the CAPS five goes up to 80. So a, a score, an average score of 35 is, is moderate PTSD, which is not severe. So that's one thing, as well as subgroups, the heterogeneity. Um, my bet would be that this is just going to be a more helpful medication for people who have existing cardiovascular risk, maybe people who are hypertensive or prehypertensive. Okay, so moving on to the third mechanism here, endothelial function. So the endothelium is that innermost layer of the blood vessels. And endothelial function refers to how well blood flows through the blood vessels and how well blood vessels respond to changes in blood flow. And one of the common ways to measure this is a technique called flow-mediated dilation. Now, this is a non-invasive technique where you have the participant lying down there and a, a small transducer that measures the diameter of the brachial artery in the arm. Now, you 
kind of uh, constrict blood flow using a blood pressure cuff. You do that for five minutes. And then when that's released, you have this effect called reactive hyperemia. It's just a temporary uh, compensatory increase in blood flow. So you're just measuring the diameter of that blood vessel before and after occlusion and, and getting a percentage. And lower than 5% is con considered to be pretty impaired flow mediated dilation. So this is a really, I think this is an important avenue for our future research in this, this link between PTSD and cardiovascular disease because endothelial function is directly imp impacted by the autonomic nervous system and the renin-angiotensin system. And it's a direct and very specific measure of cardiovascular health. So if you were to ask the question, does the car work? If you see the car driving down the road, that is an indicator that it works. It doesn't have any overt damage. Um, so on the surface, it looks like it probably works. If you pull that car over and look under the hood, you might have a different story. So that's really what endothelial function can give us, a more nuanced under the hood look at cardiovascular health. And ideally it should be combined with these peripheral measures. Heart rate and blood pressure are still good salient measures, but we really need to look in a more nuanced way. Also because this is an early predictor of atherosclerosis, the hardening of blood vessels and overall cardiovascular risk. Atherosclerosis takes years to happen, but you can see really early on uh, deficits in endothelial function. So if we think about our prevention models, uh, the, the PTSD research that we've done so far in cardiovascular disease has mostly been in this tertiary phase, right? Disease management, looking at people with PTSD who also have had you know, heart attacks, strokes, et cetera. This is a subclinical measure, which means we can be in the primary and secondary phases of prevention. So disease prevention and disease intervention. And there are some studies showing that PTSD is associated with poor endothelial function. Some in particular, um, a study in male veterans found that 63% had impaired flow mediated dilation. And this was a sample without cardiovascular disease or over cardiovascular risk. Um, in the nurse's health study, there have been a couple studies uh, looking at cellular adhesion molecules, so a molecular uh, indicator of endothelial function. And, and it's been shown that there are higher cellular adhesion molecules in women with PTSD compared to controls. And we're looking at flow-mediated dilation in the Grady Trauma Project right now, a subsample of women with trauma and type 2 diabetes. And we're finding that low flow-mediated dilation is associated with worse PTSD and worse glucose control. And this is over and above heart rate, heart rate variability, and blood pressure. So again, I, th I think this is a promising new avenue to really expand our research and our understanding of the link between PTSD and cardiovascular disease. It's directly implicate, or impacted by these other mechanisms we've been looking at, uh, but I think it's more specific. And it's an early subclinical predictor of risk that has been shown to be impaired in PTSD. All right, so I wanna move to talking about the role of sex in all of this. Now, sex differences in PTSD are well-established. Um, the ratio is about two to one for PTSD diagnosis in women compared to men. We know less about the differences in physiology underlying that. So uh, we recently reviewed this and talked about how to apply sex as a biological variable to this research in PTSD because, you know, there's really not much that we have characterized in terms of physiology. The most robust finding is that in women with or without PTSD, higher levels of estradiol appear to confer uh, better fear inhibition and better fear extinction. Even women with PTSD, if their estradiol levels are, are high, uh, are higher than the other half of the sample, um, they show fear inhibition that looks like trauma exposed controls. Now progesterone on the other hand, um, it's a little bit different. So in women with PTSD, higher le levels of progesterone have been shown to confer worse extinction retention. So uh, worse memory of that uh, extinction paradigm. But in women without PTSD, higher levels of progesterone have conferred better extinction retention. So it's likely that there is an interaction between PTSD status and sex hormone level that affects this underlying physiology. And we recently looked at sex differences in autonomic functioning in the Aurora study. 
This is a very large multi-site trial of trauma response following emergency department admission. So we had 192 participants from the ED. So they're there like right after the trauma has happened. And two weeks post-trauma, we get blood pressure as well as a fear conditioning paradigm where we have acquisition, where the fear learning is, is being modeled again and extinction. And during that conditioning paradigm, we were looking at heart rate and heart rate variability. So one thing that we found, which is consistent with what we see generally is that there was higher blood pressure in men, and that was regardless of PTSD status and a higher percentage of hypertension in men compared to women. So it's notable that in this sample, the average age was like 35. And so this is consistent with what you see in premenopausal women, there's lower rates of hypertension compared to age matched men. And I'll speak more to that in a couple minutes. We saw higher heart rate in women, um, both during acquisition and extinction phases of conditioning. And in extinction, this was particularly uh, elevated in the women with PTSD. So women who went on to develop PTSD three months later had significantly higher heart rate during extinction. And then we saw lower heart rate variability or lower parasympathetic control in women as well. And again, particularly in extinction in the women with PTSD. So one thing to take away from this is, you know, not all sympathetic arousal is created equally. I think we tend to lump sympathetic arousal together in PTSD, but really these are different things. Heart rate and blood pressure are different indicators. Um, and especially when you consider our findings for the renin angiotensin system, I think this suggests that we need to consider the possibility that different cardiovascular biomarkers are going to be more predictive of risk in men versus women. And that has uh, application to treatment as well, right? So maybe, maybe men are going to be more, or men of a certain age are going to be more responsive to medications that target the renin angiotensin system. So we don't know that yet, but I think these are important things to consider. Now in cardiovascular disease, sex differences have been pretty well characterized. Um, for one, there are rates of cardiovascular disease that you, uh, different types of disease that you see in men versus women. For example, women are more likely to have diseases of the microvasculature, whereas men are more likely to have macrovasculature diseases. And you see differences in the phenomenology. So if you picture your classic idea of a heart attack, you might think of something like this. So you have a man, his hand over his chest, crushing chest pain, you know, shortness of breath, et cetera. Um, but actually women with having a heart attack can look quite different. Um, they may not always have that crushing chest pain. They're more likely to have obtuse symptoms too, like uh, nausea or upper back pain, indigestion. And here too, estradiol appears to be protective. So I mentioned that there are lower rates of cardiovascular disease and hypertension um, in premenopausal women compared to men. And so it's thought that as menopause happens, ovarian function decreases, estradiol levels go down. Uh, you, that's why you don't see that sex difference in older age groups. So women do not have that, um, that protection against cardiovascular risk uh, post-menopause. And estradiol is associated with lower cholesterol, lower hypertension rates, better endothelial function, and it lowers activity of the renin angiotensin system. So I think what all of this suggests is that, you know, there are likely shared pathways, right? So between PTSD and cardiovascular disease, the autonomic nervous system, the renin angiotensin system, and endothelial function being some of these. Um, but that sex hormones affect all of these symptoms or systems. And so it's likely the case that there are different pathways of risk for men versus women with PTSD to cardiovascular disease. And then differences in the types of cardiovascular disease they may develop. So this is really important from a risk identification perspective, but also from a treatment perspective. So the main question I think for us in psychiatry is how best to treat cardiovascular disease risk in PTSD, not cardiovascular disease, right? That's where the cardiologists come in. So we wanna be in those primary and secondary phases of prevention. So first we have to identify who is at risk and what are the best predictors of risk? Maybe there are certain symptom presentations. Um, we don't know that yet, but again, going back to heterogeneity, maybe there's a subgroup, people with a certain pre symptom presentation who are more likely 
uh, to develop cardiovascular disease, uh, as well as traditional cardiovascular risk factors, higher blood pressure, heart rate, higher levels of renin or angiotensin II, poor endothelial function. Uh, likely it is some combination of all of these things that will best predict who with PTSD is gonna be most at risk for cardiovascular disease. And then what do we do? So one option is to treat the PTSD. Treat the PTSD and hope that that reduces cardiovascular risk. This is where we have our second poll question. Uh, what is the frontline treatment for PTSD? SSRIs, cognitive behavioral therapy, mood stabilizers, combination of SSRIs and CBT, or neurostimulation, things like transcranial magnetic stimulation and ECT. So Marge, if you could help go ahead and do that poll. Thank you. Okay, so pretty quickly, it looks like everybody's thinking combination, SSRIs, CBT. And that's exactly why I uh, asked the question this way. And I apologize, because most of the time when you have a test, uh, A plus B is usually the right response, right? Um, in the case of PTSD, the frontline treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy. There are two forms of CBT that are actually trauma-focused that have the most evidence, and that's prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy. Now, we know that for any one patient, combination could be better or they may respond better to neuromodulation, um, but the preponderance of evidence that we have so far best supports CBT. So if you have a patient with PTSD or you think they have PTSD, uh, this is the first thing you should be talking about. They should at least know about it. Um, some people don't like psychotherapy, so maybe they don't want to do that. That's fine. But people should at least, you know, be informed that this is actually the number one thing that we have. But it's not perfect. The dropout rates are up to 30 percent. Um, and, and again, I think the overall message that I would give about this is that there's not going to be one PTSD treatment just for PTSD or PTSD and cardiovascular disease that is going to be best. Um, there are lots of trials out there looking at different medications, neurostimulation, therapies. And I think what we need to have are, you know, predictors of who's going to do best in which of these already pretty good treatments, as well as to try to improve the treatments themselves. Um, in terms of cardiovascular risk reduction in these treatments, I would say we really don't know much yet. What we do know is kind of mixed, but um, so far only heart rate, HRV, and blood pressure have been looked at. So we haven't looked at more under the hood uh, measures of cardiovascular risk. And there really hasn't been a lot done here. So I think there's an opportunity, again, thinking back to the priority of the, the working group to incorporate more measures of risk into these existing treatment trials so we can better understand how our existing gold standard treatments are affecting risk. Now, another option is what I'll call treat the mechanisms. So things like transcranial magnetic stimulation, for example. Now, this is using a magnetic coil to directly stimulate areas of the cortex. In the case of PTSD, um, you're doing the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This picture is Noah Phillip at the Providence VA who has led a lot of the research on this in PTSD. Um, there, has, there have been a lot of studies showing that this has efficacy for PTSD. It's FDA approved for depression. Uh, we're not there yet for PTSD, but there's a lot of promising evidence thus far. And in healthy and depressed populations, there's evidence that this treatment improves autonomic nervous system function. So it lowers heart rate and blood pressure and increases heart rate variability. Um, and again, thinking about the dropout rate that we have in psychotherapy, uh, TMS and, and some of the forms that, that Noah is using right now, 10 minutes, five days a week for a month, and then tapering down from there, there's, uh, there's no anesthesia involved. You can drive to and from very minimal side effects. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's very promising for PTSD, but also maybe really promising for improving autonomic function and maybe reducing cardiovascular risk in PTSD. Now, another more mechanistic approach is transcutaneous cervical vagus nerve stimulation. Now, traditional forms of vagus nerve stimulation uh, are invasive and, and are FDA approved for depression, but uh, this is a non-invasive version where you have um, electrodes placed over the carotid artery, so right on the neck, and you're stimulating the vagus nerve. Now, there have been pilot studies showing that this has efficacy for PTSD and also that it improves autonomic functioning in PTSD. 
um, heart rate in particular. So uh, again, this is something that's been done more in depression, uh, but also epilepsy, and I think could be a really promising approach, uh, particularly, again, it, it, it's a balance of, of risk and benefit, right? So some people, um, you know, just may be more amenable to certain types of treatments. They have different risks, um, different time commitments, et cetera. So I think this is something that's really exciting, particularly for the cardiovascular risk that we see in PTSD. Now, something that's going to be really important, of course, in these future trials is to consider sex. In psychotherapy and CBT, we see better outcomes in women uh, and more attrition in men, but there have not been a lot of studies, I would say, and that's really the extent of, of what we know. We don't really fully understand how you know, underlying mechanisms of treatment response may differ for men versus women, how sex hormones may be involved in all of that, um, but it will be important to, to consider if we're trying to reduce cardiovascular risk in PTSD, given what we know already, both in PTSD and the cardiovascular realm. Um, so to summarize, you know, we have some really great candidate mechanisms in the link between PTSD and cardiovascular disease. So we talked about the autonomic nervous system, the renin angiotensin system, and endothelial function. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of this research has been cross-sectional, so we do need more longitudinal and ideally prospective studies, really looking early on, um, which is actually better from a recruitment standpoint. We're not trying to recruit people who already have cardiovascular disease. We're trying to look at early, early indicators of risk. Um, and again, I mentioned that there are a few other mechanisms and likely there are interactions between all of these things rather than one direct pathway. And I think there's good evidence to suggest that there are sex differences in these risk pathways, that men versus women with PTSD may have differential pathways of risk to cardiovascular disease, different types, and that of course sex hormones are involved there. And then treatment. So, I think that we have a lot of promise for reducing cardiovascular risk factors. We haven't looked at it that much yet, but we have some really good treatments, uh, CBT as well as neuromodulation, that I think could be really promising for reducing this risk in, in PTSD. Um, and something that we still don't know is if we do that, you know, if we if we reduce risk, if we lower blood pressure after cognitive processing therapy, you know. Does that actually reduce the incidence of cardiovascular disease in this population? So that's something that we really just don't know yet. And in terms of future directions, so one thing is we really need more collaboration across psychiatry and cardiology. Um, in the spring, I took a, a cardiovascular physiology course and I was just blown away at the advanced imaging methods that they have, all of the uh, diagnostic tools that they already have in cardiology. Uh, we could really take advantage of by collaborating more and incorporating that into our existing trials of PTSD. Now, some additional considerations, things that I didn't speak to directly today, but that are going to be really important in moving forward here. One is the inclusion of transgender individuals. So I've been using the words sex and then men and women. Um, Pretty much all of the research in PTSD has been in cisgender individuals, right? Where their gender identity matches biological sex. And I would say we know next to nothing about PTSD in the transgender community, except one thing that we do know so far is that they have higher risk. Um, the rate of sexual assault in women is 20%. In the transgender community, it's 50%, which is staggering. Um, so we really, don't know um, how these individuals may differentially experience cardiovascular risk or how sex hormones and hormone treatments may affect uh, those trajectories. And, um, but given the increased risk that, that they have, we really need to, to better um, understand this risk in this population. And then racism and discrimination. These are increasingly being recognized for the negative effects that they have on the brain and on the body. Uh, in many cases, they themselves are criterion eight traumas, as well as ongoing chronic traumas. And uh, so that's 
really important to consider when we're thinking about cardiovascular risk and that chronic activation of the stress system. So how these experiences affect individuals with PTSD in terms of their development of, of cardiovascular disease. And then co-occurring disorders, substance use and depression in particular. So substance use is seen in upwards of 50% of individuals with PTSD. Um, very often it starts as a coping mechanism or actually an avoidance mechanism, right? Because in the short term, it can help someone avoid thoughts or memories, kind of shut all that down. But in the long term has a lot of negative unintended consequences. And many times those individuals are excluded from PTSD trials. So we really don't understand uh, that co-occurrence very well. Um, and then depression. So that's seen in about upwards of 80% of people with PTSD. And if you remember the, the symptoms, uh, with our change to our diagnostic manual, we have essentially required a depression component to PTSD. Uh, this, if you look at the seven symptoms of that cluster D, negative changes in cognition and mood, um, looks a lot like depression. So, um, and both substance use and depression have established sex and gender differences and both carry an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So I hope this can be seen as opportunities for future research. You know, I think there's a lot of exciting things still to do, um, and particularly a lot of really great tools and treatments that we can better utilize to identify and ultimately reduce cardiovascular disease in individuals suffering with PTSD. And so with that, I want to acknowledge some of my mentors, uh, Carrie and Diego here at McLean, Jill Goldstein over at MGH, my wonderful research assistants, Julia and Teresa, and our participants, as well as my funding sources. Uh, so thank you all so much, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Terrific, that was beautiful, very educational, interesting, informative. We have a few minutes for questions and answers, so I encourage folks to put their questions in the um, box, and um, I'll take the prerogative and get, and get started. And um, you touched on this in different ways, but I wonder if you could, if that, you could maybe um, just share your thoughts a little bit more on the, the conundrum here of, do you see PTSD as causing cardiovascular disorders, cardiovascular disorders as increasing risk for PTSD, or some other causative central factor, HPA axis, ANS, neuroadrenergic systems, or whatever, contributing to both, and they're correlated more so than causally related. Any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's one of the challenges that we have here, and it's probably all of the above, right? Uh, there's actually a, a subset of research looking at PTSD from cardiovascular events as well. Um, so I think likely there's a lot of, of shared risk. I think the renin angiotensin system is most exciting for looking at that. Um, we've also seen in, in some of our genetic work that we're doing right now that there is shared heritability, of PTSD and cardiovascular disease or shared genetic risk, I should say. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think that it's very linear. Um, I do think that there are probably, you know, individuals who are at risk for both. And that's something that we have to better characterize who, um, it, and again, it's so tough because it's PTSD, right? So doing prospective research is very, very difficult. Um, the veterans, the military samples are, are often used as a good prospective design because you can get, you know, folks without trauma at, before they, you know, deploy. Um, and look at existing cardiovascular risk. But um, yeah, so I think it's likely all of the above. Yeah, you know, and I think we often think about, um, we're kind of trained to think about mental health disorders as of the brain and the body is just the body. And these, you know, if there's a connection, maybe the, maybe it's just sort of a random in interesting observation. But if we think about, you know, the fight or flight system and the threat response system and the need for cardiovascular response and the need for, for you know, using metabolic resources, um, perhaps I guess it's not so surprising that these are maybe more, more integrated than often has been considered. Absolutely. Um, a couple of years ago, I was trying to decide uh, my sort of research trajectory. Do I wanna go more into the EEG realm, which was really fascinating to me looking at the brain or more of this cardiovascular side of things. And it was actually Noah Phillip who said, yeah, these are connected, right? <laughs> like, you know, this is, um, there is a neurocardiac circuit. You have frontal regions of the brain projecting to hypothalamus all the way to brainstem, which is where all the autonomic stuff kind of begins, right? So um, 
these are innately connected. And in PTSD, we know a lot about the neural deficits and we know a lot about the peripheral psychophysiology, but we haven't looked that much at um, these as a whole system, the brain and the heart together, um, which has you know, relevance for cardiovascular disease as well, right? It's not, we can't, we shouldn't just look at the heart, um, but really the whole system. I um, wonder if you care to comment on one of our questions that come in, in the Q&A, um, that there was some indication that using beta blockers early in the course might prevent progression of PTSD symptoms. And I know um, some of the folks in Boston um, were involved in some of that work, you know, sort of built on the, the consolidation ideas of, of beta adrenergic blockade. Um, and some of the early findings were maybe hopeful, but then maybe some of the later findings were less. Any, any, any updates or thoughts on that for beta blockers? So I think there's a, you know, there's PTSD generally, but then there's PTSD with cardiovascular risk, right? And I, beta blockers, you know, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but, you know, from my understanding, they're mostly acting to reduce heart rate, right? As opposed to directly having an effect on vasoconstriction. So I think for the subset of people with PTSD and cardiovascular risk, I, I really think that the renin angiotensin system and medications that target that system and vasoconstriction in particular, um, including you know, stroke volume and systemic resistance, like those are affected by ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, where beta blockers are really not affecting that system. So I think um, w when it comes to that cardiovascular risk in PTSD, I, I think that um, you know, it's probably gonna be the case that these medications that act more, um, more broadly on, on vascular function are gonna be more salient, right. but again, subsets, heterogeneity. Yeah, no, I think all that makes sense. And I think um, some of the earlier work from Jim McGall and others on beta blockers as being involved in consolidating threat memories were what some of that was built on. And I think some of the issues are propranolol doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier as well as others. So whether it's the right one or Thomas Hart, you know, or whether other ones need to be involved instead of propranolol. And I think the main issue with some of the early emergency department studies too, was the all the animal data were like the first few hours of consolidation, but they couldn't get it in the humans that quickly in their emergency departments. And so it was like 12 hours or 24 hours afterwards. And it looked like it might have decreased sensitization, but didn't really affect that initial consolidation. So I think whether the that consolidation question has even really been tested properly is still up for grabs. Um, another question um, is a great one. Um, in addition, in, in your listing your other areas of research. Is there a consideration for examining sleep patterns and sleep disruptions as maybe a shared mediator of cardiovascular and PTSD risk or Ab other connections? Absolutely. Um, individuals with PTSD are more likely to have chronic uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and that is a pretty strong salient risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And we know that you know, there's a lot of sleep disruption in PTSD. There's sort of insomnia, you know, but there's also nightmares. So that sympathetic system, you know, constantly being aroused and, and people, you know, sleep has been called sort of a hidden variable in, in psychiatry, right? So all of those negative sleep disruptions are affecting uh, cardiovascular risk for sure. So that I, I think that people with co-occurring sleep disruption, particularly sleep apnea, um, are, are going to be at increased like, risk of, of cardiovascular disease. Um, a lot of people with PTSD just don't want to go to sleep, right? If they know that they're going to have nightmares, not sleeping is, is, is an avoidance mechanism. Um, yeah, so. Great. So that was from Scott Provost. Thanks, Scott. Another question from Philippe Bouchard. Um, it's a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, could you comment on um, coexisting uh, cardiovascular disease and PTSD management? Um, for example, um, when somebody maybe is having a panic attack and maybe misattributes um, cardiovascular symptoms to sort of the panic symptoms, but maybe they also are cardiovascular risk versus you know, long-term management of combined cardiovascular and PTSD risk. Any thoughts there? So it is, is the question, sorry, uh, Philippe, is the question you know, how to kind of address concern for cardiovascular symptoms in people who actually have cardiovascular risk? Is that kind of... Okay. That's a good interpretation. There's several questions yeah. buried in there. We'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, you know, it's it's something that you, know, you have to consider in people with with panic disorder. You know, the primary treatment for panic disorder is exposure, interoceptive exposure, and it's a tricky balance. You know, if somebody already has that risk, um, you know, you need to kind of acknowledge that 
this is not completely irrational fear or oversensitization, they have actual risk. Um, and so in that case, it's, I think a little bit more nuanced, um, you know, it's maybe you have a discussion with the patient about what's sort of normative, right? Like, well, if you're giving a presentation or taking a test uh, or having an upsetting conversation, you know, it's normative that your heart rate's gonna go up, right? And kind of at what point is there maybe a, a, a boundary that you've discussed with your doctor for like, okay, this is when something is really problematic. There's an arrhythmia happening. Um, you know, I'm lying in bed, not thinking about anything. Um, and I'm having these, these symptoms. So, and again, I think that's an opportunity for more collaboration between psychiatry, psychology, and cardiology. Yeah, absolutely. Elliot Gelwin from the Stu says, um, can you comment on the ca contribution of the HPA axis, be that chronically high cortisol or dysregulated cortisol suppression and, um, and how that might contribute, what do we know about the effects of the cardio of cortisol dysregulation and cardiovascular risk? Yeah. So the cortisol findings in PTSD have been really tough to replicate. There's a, a lot of mixed findings, you know, findings showing that there's um, higher uh, basal cortisol, but then insufficient cortisol increase during stress, which is kind of paradoxical, but it's, you know, thought that the, there's sort of this um, exaggerated negative feedback of cortisol. So you're actually not having enough of a response. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think that we fully understand the cortisol role in PTSD period. And then, you know, adding to that, how it's uh, implicated in cardiovascular risk, I think is still to be determined. Um, I think part of the, the tricky thing is measuring cortisol. So I think that's part of the reason for the mixed findings that we have in PTSD is, you know, when you measure it, um, how many times. Uh, so it's, it's not as robust as, for example, nor, uh, norepinephrine. Uh, that, that we, we know that people with PTSD have higher levels chronically of norepinephrine, um, but yeah, cortisol, I think it's a little bit more mixed. Great. Maybe a last question about sex differences. Is there any evidence that, um, you know, if this is in part related to circulating estrogen or progesterone, well, A, how much evidence is there that this is something about you know, differences in, in genetic sex based on X or Y chromosome versus is it estrogen, progesterone, or other hormones? And then secondly, is there anything on pre-post puberty or pre-post menopausal that suggests relationships? Mm -hmm. So I remember looking, there are a couple of studies by Faree um, looking at uh, contraceptive use and PTSD in the acute trauma aftermath and kind of bringing up this question of endogenous versus exogenous estradiol or, or progesterone. Does it matter where it's coming from? Does it kind of look the same? Um, you know, because typically women who are on contraceptives are gonna have lower levels of estradiol than those who are not. Um, and I think one of the things that, that they found was that women who were given, who were, had a sexual assault and then were given an emergency contraceptive um, still demonstrated lower intrusive symptoms afterwards. In other words, that the, the um, exogenous administration of estradiol was still protective, which is consistent with what we see with endogenous estradiol, higher levels being associated with lower PTSD and, and better fear inhibition. Um, the, the age, you know, I don't think we really know that yet because we haven't uh, it generally risk for psychiatric illness goes down with age uh, for, for most psychiatric illnesses. And um, we don't really have data in, in postmenopausal women, for example. Um, but I think that, and again, that's obviously challenging, but, um, but yeah, I think that's, I'm some really interested in that and this idea of exogenous versus, and versus endogenous. What's, you know, how much does it, does it matter? Um, so. Wonderful. Well, on that note, there are no more questions and answers in the thing. So we'll give people back a minute and thank you again, Antonia from the Grand Rounds Committee for a very enlightening and, and interesting um, presentation today. Thanks so much. See everybody. Actually, I, I imagine next week, Grand Rounds might be uh, is Veterans Day, so there may be a week off and then we'll be back. So any final words, Chris or Marjorie? All right, thanks everybody. Have a great day. Thanks. thanks.